Good evening to this evening's Regen Ag uh, chat. There we go. I was going to say webinar and I got confused. So this is number 16 and uh, this evening we're joined by Ian and a special late minute, last minute uh, guest, which is Tanya from the Netherlands. So we'll come on to them in a second. Uh, so Nick, what have you been up to since our last one? Well, the kids have, have run away with the hairdryer, so I am looking particularly bedraggled. But um, th we did the last one exactly four weeks ago today, and we did just mention uh, Ukraine. And then three weeks ago, uh, Renault got out of bed one morning and looked out the window and saw the stop trailer and said, and we were listening to all the Ukraine stuff, and said, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the stop trailer full of stuff and go there which started this kind of snowball. And three weeks later, um, we've um, sent four loads to um, the Ukraine border, raised um, 20,000 pound on a GoFundMe site. This is all us and a, and a few good mates. And um, we've had donations of medical stuff. So altogether, I think we've sent 22,000 pounds worth of medical stuff and loads of food and some wheelchairs. And, um, and we've just, um, it's been completely knackering, if I'm honest. Um, but we've met some amazing people. We helped some refugees across the border. Um, when Reno went, they they picked this. It just kind of brings everything home to you. They brought this lady back. Three families, but one one family was a lady. She was like a professional. She worked for a medical company, and she came over to Amsterdam with her son, who was about nine and her daughter-in-law, and she'd left her husband, um, an older son, over there to fight. And, um, and she said to um, Reno, she said that she kind of previously thought of herself as like a very confident and, um, you know, all with it lady. And she just, she just said, and I'm an absolute wreck. And, and I, I just, you know, my life's gone to tatters in four weeks. And I think, um, yeah, so we've just, been on that full on for for the last three weeks and um and i'm now a bit knackered but um but yeah and then carbon calling wise um it's tootling along um speakers are i'm trying to find beds for speakers if anyone wants to give who's a local farmer who wants a bed um and um and it's yeah, quite no. dubious or could be slightly dubious I know, ideally well, a minute, separate I've bedroom got, at the minute, I don't know if Tim Nicholson's on, but I've got um, in his house, there is Michael Blanche, uh, Alec Brewster, and who else? And Janet Hughes, and maybe Patrick Holden. So that will be maybe the party house. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it's all going well. I'm just tired. Well, How, well how's lambing? How's lambing? We're nearly through it. So I'm tired for a different reason for getting up in the middle of the night. Um, and I've started to mount my own, my own built on. Both of them seem quite, uh, what's the word? Small compared to Ukraine story. But my new built on box is very exciting. Built on, built on. So it's dried South African dried meats. So I'm, I'm drying my own meats. Oh, get you. <laughs> no, I've, I've gone very nice. Anyway, be quite, it's, what lambing does, sleep deprivation makes all things happen. So I know, good. I know. Well, yeah, I know. I just, it, you just, it's just quite hard um, without sleep. But yeah, but I'm looking forward to this. I, I haven't. Um, you've done most of the kind of um, legwork with this, so I might sit relatively quietly and just pop in when I when I need to. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So this evening, we're going to be joined by Ian Bell and also Tanya Decker. So, and the, the main thrust of the conversation really is about food webs within soils. So looking really at soil biology and understanding that a bit more. The key reason that Ian's invited, obviously other than he is very knowledgeable, is that he's planning to do, or we're doing a workshop with him at Carbon Calling in June. So he's coming along to Carbon Calling. Um, along with his microscope and um, we'll do a bit more work with him out on the day either on the Saturday or the Sunday we haven't quite decided that yet but anyway you will be in Cumbria in June so I don't know whether Ian if you if it's if you're happy to just to give yourself a quick introduction before we make a start and then uh, Tanya I'll ask the same okay cool am I am I live now 
Yep. Yeah. So, hi everybody, and and thanks Liz and Nick for inviting me along to to do this, and and also along to to carbon calling, which I'm really looking forward to, and hopefully it'll be quite a fun thing. We'll bring our microscope along and uh, and a big TV, and all being well with no technical glitches, we'll get them all hooked up together and. If any of you want to bring some soil along or some compost along, we can get it up on the big screen and have a quick scan round and and see what see what's there or or isn't there. Um, so a little bit of my background that I, I, I guess going back a bit was family farm in the Dales, dairy cow sheep, Harper Adams degree, and then later an MSc all in conventional ag um, work for Velcourt um, and sort of pushing all the buttons on things that we maybe know now probably shouldn't be trying to get as many litres as we could and many tonnes per hectare and a lot of damaging practices. Um, my career was sort of cut slight hands-on farming career was slightly cut short with a, an accident and the spinal injury but looking back now it's uh, maybe a blessing it stopped me doing any more damage to soils um following that did work a bit of advisory work for 10 years or so with a consultant from ireland working on eu type projects in in different third countries and diversified a little bit in in sort of we what started as a business selling lamb online from the farm here at home then fledged into an outside catering company and did that for a number of years. But for me, that that step away, even though I was living still on the farm and family farming all around me, was probably quite important because it allowed me to sort of take a step back and look and think about what I was doing before. And and that led into sort of coming across the likes of Alan Savory and and Gabe Brown and Joel Salatin and, and the route probably a lot of you will have Will have, will have gone down and becoming thoroughly absorbed in and reading as much as I could, you know, books by Charles Massey and, and the whole plethora of, of information that's out there. Um, then I came across Dr. Elaine Ingham and the, the work she was doing with the Soil Food Web School. And, you know, I'd done a little bit of training with, on the grazing with holistic management, but was still sort of scratching my head how we could take what was an interest and a passion into something that was a little bit more than that. Um, the training with the soil, foods, soil Food Web School kind of opened that door for me. Um, and so for the last two and a bit years, it's been a lot of, a lot of study and a lot of research and, and learning. And, and, and I think that learning will continue for a long time to come because there's so little we know about what's happening in the soil. Um, so we, we've now qualified to do as a soil food web lab, so we can do analysis and provide you reports telling you what's in the soil, whether that's your F to B ratios or what biodiversity and levels of, of the different microbes you have. Um, so that using that as a, as a tool, we're also in the progress of hopefully this year completing the, the consultancy accreditation program with the soil food web and Tanya's on the, the call with us. Tanya's a really experienced soil food web consultant and and the, the two of us have a weekly meeting and chat about ideas and Tanya's sort of been for the last 18 months sort of guiding through the the, the ups and downs of making compost and and then trying to get really really good compost with a lot of diversity. So you know, we're looking for that fungal content, but we're also looking for diversity of protozoa, bacteria, and nematodes. And I think gradually after sort of a lot of sort of early fails, we are starting to get piles that are, have got that, that quantity of fungi in that we want. And, um, and then now starting to sort of take that out onto, onto farm and working with at the moment, sort of four or five farmers in, in the Yorkshire Dales and across in Cumbria um, this year to in varying from sort of six hectares up to sort of, I think, maybe 50, 50 hectares on some of the places, but certainly not taking whole farms on, but looking how we can 
you know what we can do to move those soils on um and yeah so that's where i am thank you very much tanya welcome yes <laughs> you you had about two hours notice so thank you very much for joining us <laughs> i'm gladly do it uh, my name is tanya decker i'm stationed in the netherlands um i have i'm a soil food web consultant graduated in 2019 once i started my own practice dr elaine hired me as a mentor i have 60 students worldwide so i start my day in australia go up to Thailand, go to Cambodia, then do all of Africa and Europe, and then I do New Jersey and then go cross over to America. That's my day. That's what my day looks like. Uh, world travel every day. Um, I also have five individual projects myself. So I have worm hotels in my own town because I want neighborhoods to spruce up their own neighbors, uh, neighborhoods, right? So we've been doing that for a couple of years now and all of their gardens are really wonderful. So now they've branched out to take care of the trees that are in their uh, street, which I find wonderfully. And actually they produce so much compost <laughs> that I get to use it in some other projects that I do. For instance, a food forest that we've just uh, put in this month of March and I help dairy farmers switch over to regenerative agriculture. That's me. That is an incredibly varied introduction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I like the idea of a worm hotel. So is it that you just briefly talk to me what is a worm hotel? Yeah. So I have worm hotels that are above ground and ones that are below ground, right? Sometimes you have these um, deposits that are below ground. You open up a, a, a lid and then you put in your, your garbage, right? So I turned one of those around into a uh, worm bin. And that means that my municipality, my, my city, does not have to get that for uh, less than 18 months. It, we, um, so we, are, we don't have to send out a driver, a pickup truck, like a, a huge truck. It used to have to go and pick it up 70 times a year, right? But now they don't have to do that because they have to do it once every 18 months. So that is a huge cost saver because now they don't have to collect the greens because it's being um, produced into compost and then it can be applied immediately. So this is your food waste? Yeah. Food waste, yeah, from regular people in a regular neighborhood, right? Now, if the rules are, are if you are above ground with your hotel, then you can't put any processed foods in there because it would attract rats. So they can only put in if you, you know, if you have cauliflower, you eat the cauliflower, but the rest of it you, you put to the, to the worms. So the uncooked vegetables, right? That's what you put to the worms. But the other rule is that you have to put in twice as much brown, like carton or paper or brown paper or anything woody. Then you put in green so that we get a nice high fungal count. And that's really going to improve their lawns and the trees and the flowers and whatever they have. So, so how many people are, you, are in this system? Or how many in the neighborhood? Or yeah, so it's per, the neighborhood has to apply themselves. Five of them have to say, "I'm going to feed the worms," and then up to twenty-five other neighbors can sign up afterwards, right? And they get a little pass. So they open up the gate, right? And because yeah. other people could vandalize it or put in plastic or not know what they're doing. So it's regulated. I'm working with my, my, my city to do that. And they're very happy with it, right? Because it mm -hmm. saves a lot of money and you get all of this compost and you can apply it to, to your soil. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, but the ones below ground, you can put in anything anything mayonnaise your rest of your dinner anything you can put in it's just that the, the rats can't get to it because it's completely closed off right but the ones above the ground rats can always get in because they're really very um Wiley. athletic i guess <laughs> <laughs> Very logistic question, or how do you get it out, the below ground one? How do you get the compost out? Yeah. Well, that's regulated already. Not, you know, we have these bins. One is for paper, one is for glass, one is for uh, rest, and then one is for green rest stuff. And then you, they just have a, a, a machine that picks it out and just dumps it into a truck. 
and that's what it was anyway, but now they have to have an empty truck to, to empty out the worm compost. And then we collect the worms, put them back in the hotel and lower it for another 18 months. We just, the Netherlands is just so much better than us. <laughs> anyway, before we get into that, we're moving to continental Europe. Um, thank you very much, Tanya. There's a few questions coming on worm hotels, so we'll come back to them. Sure. Um, but Ian, I didn't know whether you just wanted to flick that first slide up just as a bit of a uh, sort of intro to what we're on to talk about. Yeah. yeah. That one there. Oh, can everybody see that? Yeah, just needs to be flicked onto full screen. Is that, have we got the... Uh, ne uh, the next one. It, there we go, perfect. That's cool, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot going on, on here, but and, and some of you will have probably seen this before, um, and, and I won't go into too much detail, but if we sort of quickly work through it as a flow, um, the you know the bit about the plants i'm sure we all know that that we plants are, are our solar panels they're the the thing pulling the energy down into the soil pulling carbon down into the soil and she's the mouse please look and and converting the carbon into sugars um and they, they can be putting up to 40 percent of the of the sugars they produce into the soil and and that isn't purely because they've got an excess of sugar it's because they know that they can use it as a, as a trade-off. No sugars will be lots of different recipes that will be calling for different nutrients from the, the bacteria and the fungi. And the bacteria and fungi have the capability of solubilizing nutrients from sand, silt, clay, um, which so when we, we conventionally look at a, a soil chemical analysis, we're only measuring soluble nutrients. But there is a wealth, any amount of nutrients locked up in these, these particles. And then the thing that is missing is, is these microbes that can solubilize that. Um, and from that point on, we, we've got two different sort of methods of the plant being fed. The, the sort of conventional nutrient cycling is where we've got bacteria and fungi, and then the protozoa will come along and it will eat the bacteria and as our American say, friends say, it's start of the poop loop because the protozoa doesn't need a lot of those nutrients and, and they're passing out those nutrients right next to the plant. So it's getting its, all the nutrients it needs from this cycle. And then protozoa might be eaten by nematodes. Nematodes might eat nematodes. Protozoa might eat nematodes. And we're just suddenly building up on this layer and layer of nutrient cycling. And it's all happening in the, in the rise of fear. In the, in, the, in the sheath around our roots where these sugars are. So plants are getting the nutrients they need, the water they need, plant defense, chemicals, hormones, everything a plant needs to grow is capable of being provided from this soil. But the, the thing that is missing is particularly the fungi and the protozoa and the nematodes. And as we move up the, the arthropods, the dung beetles, the worms, the things that we can see when we take a, a spade and have a look in soil. Um, so th those are, you know, that the idea of our spade being our most important tool. Let's see what's there with the bigger organisms. But what we can do with the microscope is, is check out and we can we can quantify and measure all these smaller guys. Um, and and the, this idea of nutrient cycling has been around for a little while. Dr. Elaine Ingham was one of the, the first researchers to sort of hit on it and research it. And then latterly, um, Dr. James White has been coming up with his theory of rise of HG, where plants are capable of actually absorbing a bacteria and a microbe, stripping the nutrients off it needs inside it, and then spitting that bacteria back out, but in a form that the bacteria is still alive. So just an amazing amount of symbiosis and interactions going on and signaling between plants and microbes and we know nothing you know we know one two percent of maybe what's happening under there but you know that's that's the the challenge for us to learn more but it you know at basic level you know there's that understanding that there is enough nutrients within the soil and 78 percent of our atmosphere is nitrogen and there's 
you know, we 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 all know about the the rhizobia that can form nodules on legumes, the clover, but there's a whole wealth of other free living nitrogen fixes that don't need the symbiosis with clover. So what we need to do is is reestablish these guys and then, and then reestablish them in a, in a balance. So if we just click on a couple of slides, go on to the next one and the next one. So this one here, I'm not going to the full detail of it, but left hand side where we've got dirt, bare ground, we've had an earthquake or we've plowed and tilled and plowed and tilled and, and just created sort of ground zero of soil. We, we've virtually got no fungi. It's, it's completely bacteria dominant. And if we leave this for nature, it's going to take a few hundred years, but she'll send in those early colonizer weeds, those with little short roots, grow fast, loads of seeds. She wants that ground covered and gradually we'll start to get a little bit more fungi. Then our brassicas will follow that. So, you know, that would be commercially an oilseed rape or any of the kales and other things that early succession. And then we're moving on, we're gradually getting more fungal dominance. So we get our early succession grasses and different vegetables. And this is, you know, I guess for a lot of people listening, this is, you know, this is where we want to be. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about productive grasses and all our cereals are, you know, the members of the grass family. And we want soils that are an equal balance of fungi to bacteria or just slightly less. So in that range one to one or 0 0.75 to one. Um, and, and if we if we let nature just take her toll, take her course, you know, it's going to take a long time, but she would keep moving on, on. We will start to get woody shrubby species coming in. We'll get deciduous trees coming in. And finally, a few hundred years down the road, we'll end up with old growth forest. And that soil could be anywhere between 100 to 1,000 parts fungi to one part bacteria. So completely fungal dominant. Um, and then the, 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 the key message in this is where we should be in the middle with productive grasses, you know, we go in and we overstock or we put a lot of fert on or we till. I do all these damaging practices and we're just pushing it back in succession all the time to a point where where the soil is is in the, in a great place to grow weeds and therefore we come in and we we plow the weeds we put more herbicides on and we're just trapped continually pushing it back in succession and um more and more on and uh, as the saying going you know we maybe become more on farmers um and then you know it's of, of utmost importance and highlighted at the moment is the cost of doing that is is you know that's machinery costs that's chemical costs that's fertilizer costs and you know we don't need them if we can just get this balance in the soil and it, it isn't just about the fungi and bacteria it's about as we move across that line increasing the amount of diversity of microbes so that's the protozoa the nematodes we want a bacteria feeding nematode we want a fungal feeding nematode we want the nematodes that predate on other nematodes and and, and within that will be the root feeding nematodes, which is something like 95% of the research done on nematodes is focused on the 5% of nematodes that are the root feeders, the plant pathogenic ones, and, and very little research done on all these other guys. And I mean, the point of what we're trying to do is get that equilibrium, that balance back in there. And our pred the, the root feeders can't move very fast, so the predators that's a nice easy prey for them and if we get the predators there they'll keep the root feeders in balance and you know as with all things in nature in nature is more than capable it's had 3.8 billion years to work out what these balances are we need so you know that's that's the background of what we're sort of looking at and and the theories behind it um and i suppose a question for me and tanya may also june add I want to add to this, which is the challenges with researching this is I'm guessing how do you do it without destroying the bit that you're trying to research in terms of understanding those interconnections of what's happening in that root zone? How do you how is it done? I suppose is the question. It's a badly worded question. Do you want to go with that, Tanya? Or... You, you know, you're on right on track. 
Ian, you go take it. Okay. So in, in terms of researching it, you know, we, we've got this tool sat right next to me, the, the microscope. And, and so the, you know, I've got some trial plots that we established early last year, and it's, um, we're also introducing the idea of grazing management in there. We've got, the, they're all contigu contiguous plots, but they've got a fence line across one field's set stocks, and the other's in, in regen grazing, mob grazing management. And each field has a, has a control and they are treated so we can measure you know, we're measuring grass growth, we're measuring worm counts, we're measuring water infiltration, we're, we're going to measure carbon over time, we're measuring changes in the organic matter. But, but importantly, I guess in relation to what we're talking about tonight, you know, we had baselines of what soil microbes were there and we were sampling and, and measuring that change. And, you know, the, the end goal of that is to, you know, that, that soil had no fungi, it had it had maybe an odd root feeding nematode, very little protozoa. It was all bacteria. And that's land that has just been set stocked. It's had a little bit of spot sprayed herbicide, um, but it's been permanent pasture for a very long time. So in terms of, of you know, what we consider the, the things to do a lot of damage to the soil, the, the ploughing and the and the chemicals that go with arable farming, it's, it's not had that, but the damage that the set stocking has done, you know, where we've got, roots that are you know a few centimeters long they you know it's just there's nothing getting down into the soil to push quality exudates down um and and you know grazing management's an important part of that but we've also looking at applying soil biology and and this year we're going to focus a little bit more on the humics the fulvics the fish the seaweeds and the and the other sort of stimulants that we can get in there um, so, so that that's how we would measure it. Sorry, long. No, way. no. So, so you just—it's basically at popular. You're looking for shifts in population numbers, aren't you? I'm getting. I'm sort of thinking. You're actually trying to understand what's happening at the root. You're not. You're tr there's an element of understanding what's happening with a population shift. Yeah. So absolutely. before and after, sort of all, yeah, all absolutely. tracking that. And, and it's getting away from this reduction, this science of doing it in a petri dish in a lab, where you know. You just can't do it with, with soil biology because if you've only got one agar source, then that will only feed one type of fungi. It will only feed certain types of, of different microbes. And, and we just can't measure that. But we're, you know, it's more of a holistic sort of view of looking at this. We, you know, we're measuring, fortunately, the national parks have been really great and they're helping with measuring different plant species and how they're changing. You know, we've got a plate meter so we can measure grass and it's it's trying to pull in as many parameters as possible and and you know we, we, we may never know how they all interact but hopefully it's you know we, we've you know I think Nicole Masters quite often says if we don't measure we can't manage so we're measuring as much as we can on that and um, and then you know the, the key to a lot of that will be uh, the trial plots from my sister and brother-in-law's farm is in, when they walk across that paddock, they, you know, they're going to get that, that, that feel, that intrinsic sort of knowledge of, of, you know, is it changing? How does it look? Are the cows preferring to eat one plot than the other? And, you know, when these things are sort of, those are just 10 by 10 meter plots, but when we sort of upscale it to what we're doing this year, we, you know, we, we're going to get a lot better idea of, of, you know, stock performance and, you know, hopefully we'll see health benefits and it'd be really nice to, to tie into the work that Dan Kittridge is doing with the, um, the beef nutrient scheme and, and one of the farms, which is going to be beef grazing. We're looking into the, the logistics of sort of monitoring that, getting a stake sent out to one of Dan's labs and, you know, contributing to what they're learning from a nutrient density so the meat perspective yeah so if if if, if you haven't come across dan kittridge and the bionutrient association um brilliant guy amazing guy and, and does a lot of sort of regular webinars and and then presents them really well he's um worth looking up on youtube and and for the last 10 or 12 years they've had a, a plant nutrient density program going where they've looked at something like a different 12, 12 or so, I think, different 
plants, you know, whether that's wheat or a courgette or a tomato and, and got thousands and thousands and thousands of data points and measuring how nutrient density change and, and linking it hopefully to farming methods. So the, the beef one he emits himself is going to be vastly complicated, but you know, if we're going to make these claims about where we're producing nutrient dense food, these, these type of projects are so important. We need to, we need to put our money where our mouth is and, and have these measurements. And um, yeah, it's quite exciting. And I said similarly with carbon, that methods of managing carbon at the moment aren't great. There's a degree of error with it, but, you know, we go with what we've got. And I think, Am I right, Tanya, that it's Dr. Ingham saying that the, um, is it near-infrared spectrometry or near-infrared is probably going to be the best way of managing, but it's four or five years away from yeah. actually being able to be used. But that will have the ability to measure the the, the carbon in fungi. Is that, is that correct, Tanya? I... That's totally correct. And I know that they're developing this. So I'm, I'm hoping it's this year or next year when it comes out. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that's a bit quicker than I thought. Yeah. yeah. So, um, can I make so, a point about? Yes, yeah, please there's do. There's one thing that people really always want to know, and that is how can we get rid of weeds? Weeds is another word for pioneer plants, really. But as you look, it's way on the left side, right? It's on the side with bacteria, and it's because they respirate the nitrate, right? As if you add more fungi, they respirate ammonium. And that suppresses the germination of weeds or what we call um, down a bit, down a bit, down uh, pioneer down. plants. And when they do pop up in your productive grasslands, then really look at them as indicators because they're telling you something that you're lacking and that's why they exist. So that was my only point. That's a really good one on as an indicator and you know that we see you know conventionally we see a weed as a problem but you know something like a like a dock may well be a, an indicator of surface crusting of of compaction that's nature's way of sending something with a great big massive taproot to to break that compaction and pull up minerals from lower down um and yeah you know let's change our mindset and think of the reason you know that the weed is a symptom but what's the problem behind it and so if if as a lot of us would have or feel so we're in we're in that cycle where we've dream we move from bare soil but we're in sort of weedy type areas we're not quite in productive grassland so where do we start in terms of understanding our bacteria fungi ratio cool so i guess the starting point would be um taking the sample now you know you can get a microscope yourself and you know we'll come on to looking at a slide here and um have a you know you can pick them up fairly cheaply and and have a whiz round and and see what's in there or you can send it a sample away to uh, a lab like ourselves or daniel takiri or eddie bailey there's a few in the country now who will give you a real quantitative analysis of what's in there um so that's your, your baseline and then um, monitoring it as it as it goes along. Um, do, do you want to, to jump onto the? Yeah, have a, let's have a look at that. that. At that point, so what we've got here to is from we, we've got four different slides. So this one is from a a compost pile of ours, and we'll just sort of point out some of the different things we're seeing in here. So. First thing that I, that I notice is we've got these sort of, can you use the mouse please, would it be? These big brown aggregates. So, you know, the, the darker browns are humic colors, the honey colors are, are more the, the fulvics. And we, we, know, we know we've got the organic matter there as a starting point. Um, what else we've seen? If we just move up a little bit on this. So, so this is, we're on 400 times total magnification. So let, let's just stop there. So just on the left there, if Olivia just points that out, see that guy there? So that's a testate amoeba. Um, and then they're potentially going to eat something like 10,000 bacteria a day. And, nice. and they don't need very much of the nutrients that's locked up in that bacteria. 
so if that's right in our root next to the root most of the most of the nutrients is consuming are being passed out and and there is plant available food there's another test state i think a little bit lower down so just tweet the focus please is that another test state it is the, the, yeah. yeah in the middle and then so the thing like a rugby ball that's a fungal spore yeah um we're not certain when that would germinate, but one would hope when that this compost goes out that if the moisture is right and the conditions are right, that that's going to germinate into into fungal hyphae. If we just keep moving on, and right here we go. So this is um, what I start to get excited about with with compost. So these these brown strands, or if maybe it just points these out these are fungal hyphae and this is what we're not seeing in soil and and we know this is is likely to be a really good beneficial fungi because it's it's an even width it's got the little let's go into that one that's even better so let's just tweak the focus on that and if one of the the sort of tells is a little scepter the walls across so if olivia just points that out we know we've got an even width all the way along and it's really dark brown color. And yeah, if we can start and get these in our soil, then we know we're on the right route. Um, and then the great thing with it, the fungi, as they get older, they, the walls are made of chitin so that young fungi might have a C to N of 20 to one, but as they get older and those cell walls get thicker, that's the point of laying carbon down in a real, really stable form. Um, like this won't be a mycorrhizae fungi, that will only grow where there's, there's an interaction with roots. But if we saw this from soil, it may well be a mycorrhizae. And, and then those are the, 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 you may have heard of the term glomalin. So where the, the it's, a, it's a glycoprotein that is so long lasting in, in soils and you know, that's the point we can really pull carbon down. But yeah, when we see these things, Tanya, we get excited, don't we, in compost? Yeah, this is really great to, to have this really strong fungal hyphae there. That's really good. Yeah. It's, and then sadly, if we, um, <laughs> if we just swap a slide over, Tanya, do you want to just talk for a moment or two while we change slides over here and look at the soil to sort of compare Tanya, the can, Tanya, can I just ask, I mean, this is for me. This is absolutely amazing, and, is it? Uh, and yeah, I just love it. It's quite addictive. Um, but is is this one of your when you're trying to get farmers or farmers are just kind of starting their journey into this? Is this is this the kind of good starter drug just to get them kind yeah. of begin yeah. to get hooked? It is totally, you know, and um, you know, you the compost is really an inoculation. And then once the biology uh, has found again, the relationship, a symbiotic relationship with the plant, which is the whole thing. <clears throat> when you are a plant, normally you would make all sorts of exudates, which is really um, a batter. You know, what they, the sun shines, right? They take the CO2 out of the air. They break off the O2, oxygen they don't need, right? They throw it away. They end up with a lot of C's, carbon chains. They make sugar out of it, loads of sugar, and they make proteins out of it, loads of protein and carbohydrates. Now, if I send you to the kitchen and ask you to put in a bowl <clears throat> a lot of sugar and a little bit of flour as, you know, for carbohydrates and a little bit of protein, maybe an egg, and I make you batter this, you'll make a batter, right? So that's what plants do all the time. And the sugar is a code for what they want. So the, the sugar has a coding and they want calcium or magnesium or borium or, 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 or manganese or whatever. And that's how they start the exchange. Now, if you are a plant in a chemical system, you are given this in a soluble, water soluble thing. So you're going to just take it up as a diffusion, right? The concentration is higher outside of the roots than inside the roots. So it just seeps in. At that point in time, it will stop putting out exudates because it's getting nutrients without having to do any work. Yeah. It's not that the plant is lazy, it's that it's now addicted to the drug, to the easy minerals that are uh, water soluble. 
So if you're going to switch over, you need to teach your plants to do the work again. Set out, you know, push out the exudates, make these uh, symbiotic relationships, and then you'll have a, a, a really good kickoff. And as far as kind of the getting away from the drug addiction, yeah, um, because there'll be maybe people on the call who who are still using, you know, I, yeah. I guess a lot most a lot of people on the call will still be relatively conventional. Totally understandable. Uh, and and how, how long can, because when we stopped using um, fertilizers, we had a, a dip for maybe two years, three, two and a half years, and then kind of came out of it. Is that typical? Yeah, <clears throat> if it's, yeah, I, with me, I see if, if uh, a land has been um, fertilized for 30 years plus, I need a remediation season. You know, I need, I need to turn it around because especially if glyphosate has been used, to terminate certain uh, crops, it changes the organic matter. And I have to do something in order to fix that. So um, we put our, in an understory cover crop, right? For one season, and that's from the fall until the springtime. And we hope to see a huge improvement just with the cover crop. And then we need, we do terminate it by a roll and crimp and we plant the cash crop immediately as we terminate the, the cover crop. And in between the rows, the cover crop can come up again, but the cash crop has to be higher. And if we can do that, then we're successful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I suppose, Nick, also some of that is we don't, or does, that could, could that be speeded up by compost application? I suppose with that two and a half year is based on natural inoculation or changes in your soil compared to putting on additional amendments i'm making it up but that's what i'm just, I'm no, just you're thinking. totally right what, what we can grow in compost is limited right we can't grow as much microbes as we want but a plant can because it has all of the ingredients that a microbe wants it's it, it's the nectar of the gods for them they can't get it anywhere else than from a plant so a plant can grow its microbiome a lot quicker than we can but then it needs to be weaned off the fertilizers, right? If it has a full-on relationship, symbiot symbiotic relationship with the microbes, you know, it gets all of its nutrition from the soil and from the microbes. And if there is, you know, in the transi transition, we usually do reduce the fertilizer until the plant has now gotten used to doing both. And then we can take away the fertilizer. It's, I think, we, you know, what we do have with the, the biology is that ability to kick start it yeah that's it and and you know we're not look this is an inoculum we're not trying to put all the microbes on that that soil needs we're just putting hopefully the, the mix of fungi protozoa bacteria and, and nematodes and you know the, the real difference is you put fertilizer on and it diminishes it's only going to get less until you put more on next year you know if we put microbes and then you know your protozoa they're re reproducing every eight hours your bacteria every 20 minutes fungi um what's the range with fungi tanya in terms of reproduction is it a few days no actually it could grow every hour if conditions are really well then it can grow really fast but of course it grows fastest if it gets the better from a plant and and so it's only it's only going to get more and this is this is kind of where um, I, I think the interesting bit comes in is, is combining different techniques. So, you know, the, the land we're working with is, is all grassland. And if we can move away from set stocking and introduce proper grazing management, mob grazing, holistic grazing, regen grazing, whatever you want to call it, but where we're allowing those plants to get a proper rest and, and we're not overgrazing and we're not taking them too short that they've, they've always got those solar panels and they're not using that root energy so the roots can start to go down and they can start to push more sugars out for the microbes. That, you know, a lot of soils, they, these microbes will be there hidden dormant. And, and particularly in, in the area where, you know, we are sort of, you know, I, I guess there'll be people on the call from all over, but. You know the, the the Yorkshire Dales area, the Eden Valley up to where you are, Nick. That you know we haven't had that history, that legacy of of a lot of 
tillage and 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 chemicals um and and organic matter is uh, certainly on the, on the farms i'm seeing that you know the the reasonable i've not seen anything below that three percent threshold and it's the, the, below that there is you know if you've got a soil and the organic matter is less than three percent there is no point putting biology out because it's that's the threshold below which it, it can't survive but a lot a lot of these farms you know the, the soil is is damaged but I would I would hope we can you know by combining all the tools in our toolbox that we can we can move it on quicker than something in, that's in East Anglia that's had and you said a 30 year legacy of of lots of chemicals very little organic matter um so it, you know time will tell with this and it will vary farm to farm um there's it, a, just a couple of questions on that one which is someone's got docs and they don't really like the docs how do they get rid of the docs but i'm guessing it's a process we have to accept them and this idea of actually how we'll come on to which is how do you start building that fungi within the soils which yeah, is so, sort of started talking about so so with docks um, get a spade go and dig a hole and it, you know is that dock indicating a, a hard surface compaction or have you got compaction further down and then address the compaction um it may well be a, a calcium issue but it, sort of if we look at addressing the problem um rather than the um the, the symptom that would maybe be first and foremost but personally you know i'd be i'd be loath to sort of go down the route of putting putting a chemical on there because we we're not addressing the compaction problem and we if anything we, we're going to set the stage for an early succession soil um and it, it's it's for those with bricks meters that it's really interesting you know where you've got weeds we've done it on the on the farm here where there's a patch of thistles and the the bricks levels in the thistles were way over twice that in the surrounding grass and and the, the interesting thing with that there was the field had a, a mob of mule gimme lambs in there and there was four or five of these mule gimme lambs were constantly nibbling away at these thistles the rest wouldn't touch them and when i did chat with my uncle and it was the same lambs coming back they they were they've been pet lambs and there was no learned behavior behavior from the mother as to what it should eat and what it shouldn't they were they were up for trying anything and and once they, they tried these thistles they were hammering them so we you know there's this lady i can't think of her name in the north america or canada who's sort of done a lot of work about training livestock to eat weeds and you know, when we realise there's a lot of nutrients in them, then, you know, if we can use livestock as a tool and, and grazing management. I know, I know docks can be bitter, but I've heard of people, you know, when that mob moves into that paddock spraying molasses or something on just to try and get them into the habit of eating it. Um, so grazing management and, you know, that might be in terms of the compaction. We, we look at pulling, um, you know, this idea of drag and drip. So we pull a a subsoil of through with with biology going down behind the the legs to get biology in, into the soil and help break that that compaction up but that 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 dock is an indicator um and you know where we we attack it with sprays we kind of setting the scene for for another problem to come along i just and just another question which is how did in terms of if fields are sort of shut up for hay rather than silage do you mean so they might be they might be gray short for some of the year and then obviously allowed to go long for some of the year is how does that affect in terms of rooting structure and is that the sort of is it a compromise or is it still not going to be as good as, I, as I, a full grub, mob grazing system I, absolutely but i think i think it's like you know, as long as we are aware that there's that we're doing a little bit of damage maybe that sets stock in at lambing time and and inevitably we end up taking those covers down lower than we want um or we we you know we come through and cut um the the, the real key to it is realizing it's going to take slightly longer for that plant to recover and then we allow for that and where the damage where the damage happens is when the regrazing happens too soon so if we'd set stocked at lambing time and then 
two weeks later we, we came back around and we're continually hammering that regrowth then you know we, we're going to be reducing the roots and, and causing problems so it's it's you know the, the, this idea of holistic management is you 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 have to do things that you know aren't aren't optimal but being aware of that and just allowing something in your system for a little bit more regrowth um like the the theories of soil health and and the practicalities of farming have got to work together and so the, i suppose the key point really is that we can put as many composts on as we want but if we're not changing how we manage the plants then it won't have an impact I, it, it, it will have a short-term impact but actually it's just kick-starting that system and what we really want is healthy plant populations driving it, 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 it exactly that it, it's um you know the, the management has to coincide with um with the with the treatment and and you know that i think the you get the the most bang for your buck with with compost is if you can get it in furrow so where and one of the farms that we're going to be work, well three of the farms actually we're going to be working with this year they're all either introducing a herbal lay into a field that's had a, a winter cover crop or looking at um we're going to try and get it introduced into into a cover without that's already there into a pasture that's already there without burning off or, or plowing and um that that you know if you there's this idea that you know when a lamb's born it, it's it as it passes out and in, into the world it gets inoculum from its mother of of the bacteria and the microbes it needs to for, for a healthy immune system and you know whether that's a lamb or human it's it's nature's way of of setting something away with with a starter pack of of microbes that will get it through those dangerous early days and, and we can do the same with with our seeds that you know each seed um is already equipped with a all of the sort of cofactor enzymes needed for its growth and, and if we can coat it you know there, there's various ways of looking at this so dr david johnson the guy behind johnson sue he he's sort of making really good quality extracts and then using the cement mixer and putting you know small i think he's only putting like a pound or two of a really good quality extract into a cement mixer with his seed turn it around putting it out onto a sheet letting it dry and the, the microbes are going to go dormant but once they go into that seed bed and there's moisture and things around then they'll come back to life and that germinating seed will will be given its best start in life the um the, the method we're going to be looking at is we've developed a, a sprayer based on the guy steve erickson in um, new zealand chaos springs if you've not come across him look steve up he's brilliant uh, quite active on social media and i think he trained with dr elaine 20 odd years ago and he tried to he tried to adapt sprayers, conventional sprayers, but just found he was sieving out so much biology to to get it through the jets and filters that he nearly defeated the the object. So the spray he's made has really wide nozzles, and in effect, you're spraying slurry out. So the analogy I've been using, and you know, proof would be in the pudding. It's it's just been finished, and we can maybe show some videos of this. Um, is that you know, the conventional way of making a, an extract is we're, we're sending a microbe on a Bear grill survival course. It's it's going out there. It's got nothing on its back. It's got no food. It's got to find shelter pretty quickly. It's got the sun beating down on it and in, everything's stacked against it. Uh, whereas I'd like to think that, you know, our microbes are going to be going glamping. That they've, got a, they've got a cozy house with them. They've got food. They've got that organic matter around them and and then the theory is they'll have more chance of surviving. Um, but as I say, that like Steve's been doing this 20 years, so he wouldn't have spent all that time developing this sprayer if it if it didn't work. Um, so but you you've done quite a lot of work, Tanya, with like on a smaller scale using compost slurries, haven't you? And found a, a real benefit. Yeah, <clears throat> actually, because you have the whole system around it. Uh, because in compost, you don't only have the microbes in there. Of course, there is soluble nutrients in there. 
there's a lot of more organic matter. Um, so th there's hormones in there. There's a, a plethora of fantastic stuff in there. So if you have a, a compost slurry, actually it really aids the germination of a lot of seeds and growth of plants. But it's expensive, right? So that's why we only make an extract, take the rest of the material, put that back into the compost. It gets re-inoculated, right? It's difficult to make huge amounts of compost. That's why we're not always doing slurries because then that's on the field. You know, that just depends on what your cash crop is all about, how much you want to invest. So Tanya, when, can I, sorry, sorry, can I, I just ask a quick question, Tanya, about docks and thistles so say you go to a dairy farm and they are really struggling with dots and thistles and they've got a real problem in their head with them yeah. do you do you say just just leave them don't just get, get used to them and we'll we'll we're just going to try and overcome this within the soil no actually the the thistles uh, they have a um what do you call that root type again uh, uh ian Tapered root, no? Tap root. Tap root. Tap root. Tap root. Yeah. So if a plant and comes up and it's a, a pioneer plant and has a tap root, it's indicating that you're having a severe compaction problem. So I say, thank you, thistle, for giving me the signal. Now, if it's just a little bit of thistle, a little bit every once in a while, you know, it's just not such a big deal. But if the field pretty much is um, dominated by thistle, then I know. Uh, we have a compaction problem and the, the easiest way to solve it is to really break it open, put the biology back in. It, it's the last time you break it open and then um, put in a, 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 a green cover and have above and beyond work together to solve the compaction. I've got a crazy story if you want to hear it. <laughs> yeah. And a food forest that I've been working on. This is the second year. The first year I, I looked at the food forest and uh, it's on a grassland that has been neglected for years and years and years. I mean, years. So um, it's, it was a completely clay uh, soil. I couldn't even get in there with my penetrometer. It had sheep grazing on it every once in a while. But at this point in time, when I talked to the group who wanted to put the food forest in, I said, it is completely bacterial dominated. It's got root feeders everywhere. We need to do something. It might take more than one growing season. So we put in a, um, a green um, cover crop with lots of uh, pen roots, tap roots, right? Tap roots. Yeah. Yep. And <clears throat> at the end of February, I went to see to see how this was going, right? It, they it had grown the whole year. So I look at the next year and I already told the group, don't get excited. You know, we might not have done the job in the, this one season. But I went in there with my penetrometer where I could not outside the fence because I put a fence around it so nobody could walk over it. Outside the fence, I can't push in my penetrometer. I I, I was hanging on it with my full 70 kilos. I couldn't get it in. So I thought, okay, now I go in there and let's see what the compaction went through. And I was, zoom, I went through mm -hmm. it. I almost knocked out my back. That's how fast I went through it. I didn't expect it. So then I thought, okay, this looks good. I'll take some soil samples. And I went back home. Again, didn't feel very confident. It's at the beginning of the season, how much fungi am I going to see? <laughs> and I was astounded. I came up with a F to B ratio of 3.0 with loads of emotives in every field of view. I was just knocked over. So I gave the green light. You guys, you can put in the food forest. It's, uh, it's fine. So now they put in the food forest in three weekends. And this, uh, today I went back to the field and I took another sample because everything's been topsy turning, right? Everything's been dug up, not everything, but where they put the trees, it, it's dug up and they walked around it in order to put in the trees. So now in the, in the top 10 centimeters, I have lost a lot of fungi, but deeper in there, I'm sure they're still there. And I'm just going to wait until that food forest is going to start to grow. But I was just so blown away that such highly compacted clay soil that I couldn't get in, still can't get in outside that field, 
yeah. has cleared up in one growing season and, and blown away. Can I just, what, so you mentioned sort of the green cover, what sort of plants would be in it? I have to look up the mix, but we, we really thought about the mix that we needed to have because we needed to, we needed some uh, tapered roots, tap roots. I'm sorry, I, I keep forgetting that word. So it can penetrate um, that soil. And by the way, I couldn't even put a rotor tiller in it because I wanted to open up the clay um, to have the seeds that I was going to put in. I thought they would have a better time if I opened it up a little. I couldn't even get the rotor tiller in. Then I decided, okay, let's bring in uh, a plow, but the plow person couldn't get through the gate. So that was the end of it. So then the only thing I could do is broadcast the seed, put a lot of you know, vermi compost over it and sprayed it twice with extract thinking that's all I have right now. That's the best I have, but it all came up, start the flower and start to do its work. And it, I'm still flabbergasted. I'll, I can send you the mix, but I have to look it up in my, uh, my graveyard. Thank you. Yeah. But on um, on that, we, I don't know whether Jim, Jim Beer is on the, on the call, but we, we're doing a little bit of work with Jim and um, we've got baseline data of from when he, before he, he moved into his new place and and the fields which which he's put into a, a winter cover crop and these are a similar, probably going to be similar species to what Tanya talked about that, that a lot of them are these, the, the brassicas, the really deep rooted radishes and the, the idea, like when we, we did the baseline measures, the, there was a, a plow pan right across that field and biology wise, there was little in there and, and water infiltration. Well, you could go away and have a cup of coffee and come back. It, it wasn't going in. So the the plan, like Jim's sort of go-to was this this winter crop that he, he's used to winter stock on really deep roots. And then it's going to be, so gone into a herbal lay so we'll hopefully in the next depends on which frost and snow we get in the coming up but and you know where we can't we don't want to be measuring microbes unless the soil's warmed up a little bit but we can go in and, and see you know we can measure the difference with the penetrometer and the biology and uh, it'd be yeah really interesting to follow and the other the other interesting part of that is that if we go back to that succession diagram that Mother Nature would go weeds, then into brassicas before she moved on into grasses. So we, we're kind of working with, with Mother Nature. We're not doing a jump from ground zero straight up to grasses that the, the brassicas he's had in there will have driven the microbiome that they want. And then that, in theory, should be a smaller step to go from that to, to grasses. But maybe we, we can do an update on that when we get other measurements and see how it goes. Ian, is this, this a little Arcella hiding here? Oh, are we oh, just change the, sorry. Oh, just, if we just change, I don't know how much time we've got, the, the screen shared, so, uh, the, where are we, PowerPoint, yeah. Is there, um, where are we showing the PowerPoint again? You're showing the water tank, the, the brewer. Cool. So if we just quickly go through these, um, Olivia and my mate Jim are possibly the world's fastest engineers. <laughs> so the idea of this is on the on the right hand side we we've got a twelve hundred liter per minute trash pump that can handle big solids, and what's happening there we we're drawing pumping out from the bottom of the tank into the trash pump. And then this, the output from that is split. So what we've actually done, where the where the hole is at the top, you would use as a priming hole, just on that little black line. We've that goes to our, that's our output for spraying. Um, and then a lot of, you know, some portion wise, I'm getting I guess three quarters of what we're doing is actually going back into the tank, and allows us to create this vortex. We've gone to the next video. And this vortex, so bad, then allows us, you know, we can put solids in there. So I think Steve in New Zealand said he's at times gone 50% compost, 50% water. 
um, expensive in terms of compost, but you know, I'm, I'm thinking we depends on the biology, but we could maybe put 50, 100 kilos compost to 1200 liters of water. But, but importantly, we, we can put seeds in there. So we're going to have a go at introducing and establishing herbal lays by banging the herbal seeds in there. But we can put our humix in there. We can put minerals in there if we need. We can put fish hydroslates. And, and this vortex keeps it in suspension. Um, and then the last video, I appreciate there's an irony in this in the shed that's got a load of nitrogen at one side. But um, no. Can you, are we blocking, can you see that, I said, are we blocking it? No, we can see it. So. So that's, yeah, that's where we are. It needs, I think, probably 20 minutes. We've got a leak somewhere, just sorting that out, and then we'll be calibrating it up and and we should be able to put a range of anything as low as 50 litres per hectare up to two or 300 litres. And, and it just gives us, you know, we, so many options in terms of what we can do. So the plan, Ian, is that this um, sprayer will, will maybe be at carbon calling? Yeah. So um, on, on the, I think the Sunday, did we say, Nick, that yeah, well, we'll, probably. we'll hopefully have it along there and... And maybe bring some of our other kit. Um, if we just where's the the um, go backwards. So we've got this um, Bacchus compost turner, which uh, this was the very first pile we we did last year. Um, and then unfortunately, um, I I bought a bit of a dog of a machine from Poland, and it, it took the rest of the year to sort of get it repaired and going, but um there was there's been quite a lot of conversation within the soil fed group about windrow turner designs and I, I chatted quite at length to a couple out in california um again worth looking up catalyst microbe they're called so keisha and casey are so knowledgeable and and been producing really truly amazing compost haven't they tanya yeah they have and and what they pointed out with the Bacchus design is the teeth in the middle. So it's what happens with our compost piles. We have a hot center and a cold outside. So the teeth design, as it goes through, chucks the hot inside out to the outside and then brings the cold outside into the middle. Um, a lot of compost turners, the teeth are all pointing the same way and just chuck it up in the air so you you might get a bit of your hot center land in the hot center again or or some of it never never end up in the middle so we if it, for, for the kind of compost that we you know we're looking at where it's really important to to get this diversity and quality of compost we're not looking at waste reduction this is about producing these really good quality compost that we can use as inoculums then um the, this machine yeah, we were excited to sort of get going with that and it can really upscale what, we, what we're doing. Um, it's probably probably not going to be that good if you've got five, 600 ton of farmyard manure. It's um, it just simply that you're going to need lots and lots of windrows. The, the height of that's um, just over four foot and I think is it six or seven foot wide. So it's not, not massive windrows. Um, but, but yeah, it's um, we hopefully if we can get geared up, we'll bring that along, Nick, and mm. we can demo that. And the other one, if there's time, is the sort of can we go back onto the um, the no, to stay on that, just go to the previous slide, please. Is the, the thermal method of, of doing these small boutique piles that's sort of um, Elaine Ingham's type teaching, and is that the Right, so another speed it up. So what we do, see the trugs in the background, they're 40 litre trugs and we're starting with 30 of those. So they're 1200 litre piles and really precise recipe that 60% browns, 30% greens, 10% um, high nitrogen, the, the party food as Elaine Ingham calls it and making sure moisture is right. So 
as this is a starting point, we we do it, mix it in two goes, and we're checking that moisture is fifty percent, mixing everything together, and then it's um, so we've already put half in, and then the, the second half will go into these. That's on a pallet, a four foot pallet, and just with some fairly narrow gauge mesh around it. And then work wise, probably takes sort of two hours, maybe half an hour at getting the ingredients and pre soaking them, an hour and a half building it. And the, the, the key to this is it's is avoiding recreational turning, that we want to turn this the minimum amount of times possible. So we know we've got a hot center and we'll turn it two or three times. And each time we turn the hot center will be, have we got another, where's it? Yeah, so these are in American numbers, but we've got that hot center and cold outside. So on turn one, we will move the hot center into the bottom of our next pile. And then what was on the cold top will go in the middle and at the bottom on the top. And if we repeat that three times, or um, well, even two times, it means that every part of that compost has been in the center for the desired sort of period of time. Um, ideally, we're looking at, as Tanya calls it, the Goldilocks numbers of 55 to 65 degrees. Um, and that would be three days at that temperature. If we get a little bit above it, we drop down to 48 hours. And if it's 70 degrees, 24 hours, 70 is you know we're borderline there because it's so easy to go from 70 to 75 to 80 and at that point your piles simply can't suck enough oxygen in and and our beneficial microbes start to die but but these turns you know if looking at the the first one it may take sort of four or five days to come up to temperature and then you've got another 12 days so within sort of 20 days uh, 15 to 20 days that's your turning done. And, and at that point, we want it to cool down and the, the mesophilic, the, the cold loving microbes, and in particular the fungi, that's the point they'll start to proliferate. And, um, and then we're, we're not going to go back in and turn that again. We'll look after it, we'll keep the water levels right. And, and we may well give it a fungal feed of, of a fish hydroslate or, or something just to boost the fungi. But with these piles, we can get, you know, we can get, um, I'm certainly getting piles now that have been, you know, that the one to one fungi to bacteria and, and we've had piles at two, three, four to one, but also getting a real diversity of, of nematodes and, and protozoa in there. And in this process, you know, it might take two or three months for the cool down, but as opposed to a Johnson Sioux static pile, which a lot less work, but you're looking at sort of 12 months before that's ready. Um, you know, we can start and then get inoculums a lot quicker with this in, in sort of three, four, five months. And um, and if we're only using, you know, that sprayer we had before, um, if, if we were going 100 litres per hectare, 12 hectares, we might only use, you know, 50 to 100 kilos of compost. These piles, um, by the time they finish, could be three or 400 kilos. So there's, you know, we can do a lot of ground just with a small pile. It's another so world, Nick taking, isn't it? Nick taking pictures. I know, well, this is right up. This is like Renault's favorite thing, but um, he'll have to listen to it on catch up. Um, but so, so, so um, Tanya mentioned book in the beginning about um, trying to get dairy farms, working with dairy farms to be regenerative. So, the, the bit that I'm maybe struggling with is we do the compost stuff and that's amazing, but you're a large dairy farm and you're producing loads and loads of slurry. Yeah. And surely when they put that slurry on, it's going to wreck everything. Absolutely. And um, we, we're hopefully we, we put into the FIPL, the Farming and Protected Landscape people who've got the, the grants available in the, National Parks and the AONBs um, asking if they would fund a, a trial. It was a little bit out of the list of things they were told they could allow, but they've gone to DEFRA and DEFRA have approved that. And um, hopefully later this year, we're going to be 
we're doing trial work at you know what can we do to to treat these these slurries so that we're not losing nutrients they're not being gassed off they're not being washed out into rivers um and we're not killing worms we're not killing microbes um and and you know we're making something that's beneficial without doing a lot of damage and then things we, we're going to be trialing there range from the the anaerobic products the effective microbes um through to looking at humix different humic products that will lock up and collate the the soluble um soluble nitrates and, and other um nutrients so that, that you know when we're applying them out there we're getting ammonia toxicity that's killing organisms but it's big risk of runoff into rivers and things so long list of things we're going to be looking at and um and then there's different microbial products so it, wow. it, there's things that can be done um but it's um yeah it's not going to be straightforward and and you know the area where we live it's you know in this sort of ideal world you'd say right well let's change our farming system so we we're not producing slurry but the, the price straw is to buy around here it's just non-starter absolute non-starter and then there's a lot of issues with management of straw bedding and and out wintering with dairy cows in this kind of area isn't an option so we it's got to be a real world solution and you know what can we do about slurry but th th there's th there's a lot of products out there and and the thing we, we're keen to try is, is a combination so the, the commercial companies are coming along and and touting their microbial product but but they're not suggesting adding it with a, a humic or a biochar or or some of these other things which you know we're going to trial and hopefully get some some ideas that you know we can move on and and in help because there's absolutely no point those putting out really good biology and all the things to look after soil if we, we then slather it in slurry that's that's killing all those good microbes yeah what's yeah. interesting is because the i mean fungi protozoa bacteria all found in rumens so there is an inoculation coming out of those animals of of yeah. of those microorganisms that have flowed out of the rumen so there's do you mean it's of value isn't it it's just how you transform it into something that isn't I, I, absolutely and that to a certain extent um the what's happening in the rumen is is an anaerobic process but but the good anaerobes and a lot of what happens in soil is is aerobic processes but but there's also a lot of anaerobic processes which, which is why you know the these lines of looking at the cashy treatments of farmyard manure and and different effective microbes the, there's a value in that and and that's how grasslands have evolved isn't it that the that it was a symbiotic relationship between a herbivore and a grass plant that the two have evolved together and the interaction of the two the and the, the, the real key to that liz is where it comes directly out of a cow it's straight onto the ground and and in theory we've got loads of dung beetles we've got lots of worms and lots of things that are going to overnight pull that down into our soil and it's it's going to be made use of pretty quickly where we've kind of gone wrong with farming is is massive manure heaps and, and slurry tanks because you suddenly end up with a a really nasty potentially or potentially nasty anaerobic process with where the the, the good anaerobes are outcompeted and you know once we start smelling these these things that we've called it's called um a good country smell your your eggy smells your sulfurs and so on and ammonias you know they're not a good country smell and they're only something that's sort of been around you know maybe since the 60s and onwards so like chatting to my dad like he, he can remember as a boy that all right they didn't have many cows but the the muck was never stored it went out straight into fields or tiny little piles that were there later spread and you didn't get those nasty anaerobic processes happening so it's um but but we are where we are that the you know we can't go out daily as as if you've got a few hundred dairy cows we can't be going out daily spreading that to to replicate nature um beef cattle it's easier you know we're, we're sort of replicating particularly with grazing management what 
mean, would have happened with herbivores centuries ago, but dairy cows, it's it's a bigger challenge. Um, and also, tannin, in terms of whether Tanya just wants to mention, do you mean we've got a few minutes left in terms of her experience with dairy farms in the Netherlands? Right. <clears throat> Yeah, so dairy farms in the Netherlands are uh, heavily regulated. So of all of the um, land that they have, 80% has to be dedicated to grassland and 20% of the land can be dedicated to maize, which is cow, cow maize, not cup of the corn, right? Yeah. And so um, we put our, you know, the biggest um, gain actually is to get the grasslands to be weaned off the fertilizers, that's the biggest part. That's 80%, right? So we turn the grass around first. And then at the same time, we start to work on the maize fields by inoculating them already. But we continue with the fertilizer program because the costs of having to buy a lot of uh, maize uh, protein food for your cows is also going to be costly. So it's... Um, it's doing it at the same time, but we, we get the grass first because that's 80% right, of what they um, produce, built. Am I explaining it? Yeah. <laughs> I think James Robinson asked a question in the chat, Liz. I've lost it now. About, where is it? Will you be ploughing the winter crop in before reseeding the herbal lay? Um, it, it's um, with, with Jim Beery. Um, no, the um, I think the plan is a light a light disc. I don't think there's a a lot of a lot of stubble left, but I don't know whether it is Jim is Jim on the call. No, I don't think he is. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't think there's a massive amount of residue left, and the idea is just a light disc. And, and there's also a question, I think Tanya's just answering it now, but is there any good textbooks on compost production, compost production on farm? Um, the, the, some of the early work that's really worth reading is um, Salbert Howard, who died around the Second World War. And um, he was sort of the, the godfather of a lot of composting methods and and it's his book whilst it's fairly heavy going in the middle the messages at the start and end of that are pretty mind-blowing because he he highlights all the problems that were starting in the late 1800s 1900s and and suggests ways around it by by using compost um sadly second world war came along and and his message was lost but yeah, him and Lady Evely Balfour would have been some of the early, early mm -hmm. thinkers on it. The Rodale Institute have got a good book on different composting methods. And so just going back to carbon calling, if, if, what, what would you suggest people bring in their little doggy bag? Um, what, what, just give us some yeah, examples. Yeah, that's a really good point is... If, if it's been if it's been a reasonable level of moisture then in theory we, we should be seeing the the microbes we need to look at in the top three inches and try and take them from as close to a, a plant root as possible um if it's been slightly drier maybe go a little bit deeper down and really importantly is in that doggy bag those those microbes need air we've got to keep them alive so Take the sample as late as you can, but when you seal your bag, seal it with lots of air in there. Because if you squeeze all the air out, by the time it comes to us to have a look at, there's a lot of things going to have died and changed in there. So lots of air in there. And we don't need masses. Um, we've got, um, yeah, you know, 100 grams, 200 grams, not masses. We just need a little bit. Um, so soil sample. Um, and, you know, bring something along of what you maybe hope is your best ground and, and what you think is is the worst. And and similar principle if you want to, if you've got some compost, bring those along, but just make sure that there's there's air in that and and then don't go and put them in the so it's June. So don't go and put them in the fridge overnight because those microbes 
have sort of got used to a warmer soil temperature just if you're taking it the day before leave the bag somewhere at a similar temperature you know maybe in an outside shed to um to what the, the, the microbes would have been in the soil I'm bringing, we had a chat with Ian in the, the day, I'm bringing, I've got a field with fairy rings, lots and lots of fairy rings, and the sheep absolutely nail the grass around those fairy rings. So I'm going to get bring some from the fairy rings and some from nearby. Nice, nice. Or post it, actually, I might do. But anyway, um, <laughs> uh, just very quickly, so James Robertson has just at Robinson, sorry, has asked, could you make a small amount of high quality compost and then be mixed with a larger amount of farmyard manure before spreading? Or does all of it then have to go through and you're basically using that compost as an inoculant to then fully compost the farmyard manure? It, it certainly, certainly it, it's something that we, we do is, is use a good compost to inoculate um, other composts and and then, yeah, definitely. Why not? Why not try it with the the farm farmyard manure? I don't know, Tanya. Have you any? Yeah, <clears throat> well, you know, the farm the the manure is you know because all of our feces, the last part of um, it becoming feces is an anaerobic process. Up until that, in the small intestines, it's an aerobic process, so it's a lot of oxygen. But the last part is to withdraw uh, as much water out of the feces in any uh, mammal, right? Uh, and then the feces is anaerobic. So it usually has anything that um, we as humans or animals can't use, pathogens, um, parasites, anything we have to get rid of from our body. So that's why it's actually pretty much important to do something before you apply it to your, your, your land. Because why would you introduce a parasite or an anaerobic, um, it's really hostile to life, really. So if we can do anything, and I do that with my dairy farmers, I, I have these big IBC crates. Is that a familiar word? In you? Yep. Yeah. 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 So those IBC crates, you can either take the plastic out and line it with landscape cloth, or you leave the plastic in, but then you take the top off, right? And you can fill that with a recipe of 10%. There, there, there are lots of recipes, but if you at least mixed 50% of your dairy slurry with 50% of wood chips and leave it there for a while until it's turned around, because then it will turn around and become more composty. This will take like eight or nine months. Um, if you have any worm composting, uh, worm uh, compost worms, you know, and you can add that in, it will go quicker. It will shave off months of maturity. So you can shave off to six months, then that's really, really great stuff to put on your land. You just have to get into the habit of doing something with the slurry in order to improve it just a little bit, at least, and yeah, then get it onto your field. I guess the problem with that is, you know, where we've got 500,000 litres, a million litres, it's um, not such a, an easy thing to scale up at. Maybe James's question was, I think it probably more farm up in you with straw, I'm guessing, is it? So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, whether that's it, I, probably the easiest route in terms of handling a lot of volume is looking at the Bikashi treatments. Um, the, the problem we've got with, with if you've got hundreds of tons of farm yard manure and to get a good balance with those brown woody ingredients so the one that's on screen there with 60 percent woody material it's going to need hundreds of tons of wood chip or straw added to it and and it, it's just not a sensible suggestion so i think trying to work with with what we've got to improve it into you know least at least make it into something that's soil friendly um you know whether that's the an aerobic approach and, you, and you're turning it and, and maybe looking at adding carbon in in the in the forms of humix or, or biochars, um, or, or you go down the anaerobic route of of the um, of the the bikashi route, which is another bikashi is not something I know a lot about, and um, we're hoping to get some trials set up up at gyms this year as well, comparing an aerobic process where we'll add in humix yeah. and biochars with and similar things with with an aerobic turn process and, and, the, and the Bikashi and 
again do sort of before and after soil analysis but yeah it's it's a difficult one it's um purely because of the quantities i think i think if james has some really good compost he'd probably be better at looking at that as an aside to use on or as an inoculum on his soil and then looking at the the large quantities of fym and and what can be done to make that soil friendly thank you just just over time but <clears throat> i think i have a feeling we've only just scratched the surface of this topic i feel like i'm now i'm now even more confused than when i started so that's oh, always wow. a good sign <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> no just as you say it's incredible we just we um yeah it's it's very clear that we don't know we know a very small proportion of what's going on in the soil but thank you very much um right. nick did you want to add anything uh no i don't i just think I, I just i do really love all this and i think that microscope stuff is really amazing i'm hoping we'll be able, we'll be able to twist tanya's arm to uh come here in june and uh um it is definitely it's the future i think yeah did you get that, Tanya? A little holiday carbon calling in June. Cumbria is sure. lovely. <laughs> I can swim. Absolutely. We'll pick you up. We'll put you up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite near the East Coast. It'll be fine. Um, but no, thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, everybody, for the questions. Um, yeah, interesting. Really, really interesting. So, yes, I'm looking forward to the session. But uh, Ian, make sure you, you spray us in fine fettle. <laughs> I no will. <laughs> we will. Uh, it, yeah, no, we will. It should be fun. And, um, and hopefully, you know, if there is questions okay. that haven't been answered today, then, you know, maybe we can pick up when we've got a little bit more time at Carbon Calling. Or, or feel yeah. free to, to ping me an email or a social media message. Or, I was just uh, going to say, Ian, how do people contact you uh, on... on in uh, Twitter, yeah, so Twitter and Instagram. Um, I think did we, were the links on the yeah, the, the, yeah. I sent them out on the invite today. Uh, or um, okay. was my email address on there? Uh, I can. What I'll do is I'll yeah, I'll send another link out to the people who attended with the contact details. Nice. I'll um, because there's quite a few slides we never looked at. I can package that up and send it across if that's. Um, that's of use to send out to people. Okay, yeah. Or if anybody's interested, I can. If you send it to me, then I can do it. I'll do it on request thing. That's fine. Nice. But no, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, yeah, thank good evening. You. I was hoping to finish before I sneezed. I apologise for that. Uh, I could feel it brewing. Uh, <laughs> it's my microbiome that's mainly sheep at the moment, just running it out of my body. Anyway, on that note, good night. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.